these, this is what I got out of today's session so far. I might have to revise the slides tonight. But uh, the next part is that uh, we have some experts here. You have heard them already. So to really get closer to some recommendations that the Academy of Technical Sciences can use in its way forward, I would like you to step one step back from your expert role and then, or maybe step in front of your expert role, I don't know, and become a politician. Uh, it's definitely a step back, I can hear that. <laughs> so what, what would your advice be based on what you have heard today? So if we start from uh, one end, uh, Professor McCulloch, would you start? I sure. think you need to press it. No? Okay. You're, okay, great. Um, well, I mean, I'm not completely familiar with uh, uh, government regulations in Denmark and, and the way things uh, work out exactly. Uh, clearly, um, uh, scientific funding in Denmark, I'm sure, is no, no different than any other place in the world that uh, scientific funding is very difficult. And I think it's going to continue to be difficult no matter how uh, brilliant we are in describing to our politicians that uh, investment in uh, basic science leads to an innovation economy and, and growth and jobs. Uh, you'll be some sector of politicians who will believe that and then another sector that won't. And so um, one thing that one can do in that regard is to uh, work harder uh, and, and, and as you pointed out uh, uh, clearly, uh, to think about uh, translational science, to do high risk, high reward, uh, transformational science, which is wrapped up in basic science in terms of trying to attack problems that are difficult ones. Uh, and energy, uh, biotechnology we heard about the, today, uh, information technology and computer science. And, and using uh, industry as a um, sandbox in some sense uh, as a way to uh, attack funding. The usual things that stand in the way of that, at least in the United States, are uh, intellectual property control. Um, you know, I don't know what the laws here, but we can't in the United States, for example, give the intellectual, pro we can't take a contract from a corporation and then say, we'll do this research for you and then you own as a corporation all the intellectual property. We say to the company, give us a million dollars, we'll do the research and then we own the intellectual property and then maybe we'll license it to you for another million dollars or something and they say, what? What, are you insane? That's the stupidest thing I've ever heard in my entire life. And so the reason is because we're bound by the law uh, to, to, you know, to, but if, we, if there are ways to make some deals with um, corporations, one of the ways that we've got, gotten around this in the United States is to say, uh, we'll give you, uh, uh, you pay for the research, and we'll give you the intellectual property and we'll, we'll, it'll be a, uh, a non-exclusive, royalty-free, we won't charge you for that intellectual property, but you won't own it exclusively, but then you'll have a period of time at which you can decide whether you want to own it exclusively, and we'll, you know, uh, uh, can make a deal for some fair market value. And we've been able to do that as a, as a way to get corporations to buy in, and then we make a master agreement where every project falls under one contract, and so there's never any negotiation. And I think that uh, uh, that it's difficult for some professors to, to, to do it that way because they feel like they're poisoning the ivory tower. But uh, I would submit to you that, uh, that uh, when, when they see what these, these most interesting problems are, there's, an, there's incredible opportunity uh, to go after that. So public-private partnerships, obviously is, is one uh, possibility. Uh, because the United States is so far behind in intellectual property, major corporations around the world are going to other countries, India and China, and, and making corporations with those countries so they can get the intellectual property. So whether Denmark can be a leader in that regard or not, I, I'm not sure. But if I were a politician, that would be the first thing that I would, I would take that off the table because that's uh, one way for the country to continue uh, to lead. You have great opportunity, you have amazing scientists, you've always been leaders in, uh, in science, there's, there's no doubt about it. And with European Union, that's even increased to a, a broader degree, I think. And so the opportunities are great, so I think those are the things I would be focused on. I think on. that's an interesting point, because I think, in fact, Danish politicians went to US 
to figure out how they should handle this issue of the intellectual property rights. So uh, maybe actually there's a topic here that could be readdressed. But there certainly are clever ways of, uh, of sort of getting around this uh, by master agreements in one contract uh, where you don't have to negotiate. You know, when you go with Carlsberg, you don't have to negotiate every single project with them. There's one contract and everybody falls under one. It's all pre-negotiated and it's all agreed upon and there's no problem. But to be fair, I think we also see that uh, here as our practice. But again, I think we are actually following U.S. to a large extent because I think people have the impression that in U.S. you have been so successful in translating research into innovation. The other, the other thing is with at Carnegie Mellon, the vice president for research, and we, uh, we create more spin-out companies per research dollar uh, in, in the United States. And we can make 10, based, 10 per year based on licensed technology. And part of that is based in, we have a, a program uh, called 5% Go in Peace. We take 5% of the company and then you go in peace. And so as a professor, you can own 95% of the company, but we own 5% as a university. It's a standard deal, again, there's no negotiation. And this has led to spin-offs. But the, it's, it's, a, it's a mistake to think that universities are going, in my opinion, that universities are going to get rich off of licensing. It just doesn't occur. One in 20 to 50,000 licenses is a big hit. It almost never occurs. And so where you can make your money is if you create wealth for your faculty, and then you tell your faculty they will buy you a building when they get very rich, and they will give money back to the university. And this is the, this is the contract you have with them. Let's come back to that topic later. Professor Paulson? Um, so, what are your thoughts? Um, some have already been spoken, but I'll say a few more things. So I guess we come here against the, the is it a little close? So I guess we come uh, together here against the backdrop of the 75th uh, uh, birthday or anniversary of the academy, and we are talking about some pretty big challenges. Um, and. Um, the theme of innovation is the one that has come out consistently throughout the day, including from the minister that spoke to us. So how are we gonna deal with innovation? I guess that's what we need to think about, and you spoke about that a little bit uh, in your uh, talk. I liked his slide on the different cultures, so I would say um, um, take a pass on the lawyers and the bureaucrats. So don't emulate the East Coast of the Brussels <laughs> philosophy and go with the doers. In California, they just go and do things, and th that's kind of, uh, I think, important. I suppose, um, um, yeah, so I guess that's in terms of philosophy. So when you go to the United States to look uh, for success, there will be one place to look, and now we know uh, Pittsburgh and Carnegie Mellon is, is another place to look. I guess the um, second thing that comes to mind here to stimulate innovation, um, you need to accelerate interactions uh, between different disciplines. And I must say, for myself personally, just sitting here today and hearing the two of them talk, I immediately started thinking about new things. So we can now think about ways to take these printable organic polymers, for instance, that can be designed down to cellular levels, and we can start to think about completely different biotechnological devices. Uh, for photosynthesis or electrosynthesis and some of these processes that cells can uh, uh, carry out. And the same thing uh, with the genomic information and this massive amount of sequencing data that we're getting out of uh, uh, the biosphere uh, here and there. So that's another theme, I guess, is, um, is this continued vigilance of cross-fertilization of ideas and running meetings like this one. The third one I might uh, uh, comment on just a little bit. Uh, my time is up? Nope. No. <laughs> the third thing I might uh, just comment on echoing some of the statements made about intellectual property licensing. Um, I had experience with two, company, uh, two uh, universities in, in the United States starting up companies. One was the University of Michigan, uh, close to uh, Carnegie Mellon, and um, uh, uh, the UC system, uh, University of California, San Diego. And what you just stated about um, completely unrealistic attitude to the value of IP, the conditions under which IP is generated and so forth, I experienced in California, not so much in Michigan. There we were given much more uh, leeway uh, to de develop a company. And I just like to state that what I have heard 
so far about the DTU and its attitudes towards IP and, and spin-out, it's, it's very healthy and maybe this is the place to come to look for models because the DTU, as I understand it, takes the sort of approach that you mentioned, uh, just becomes a stakeholder like everybody else through uh, equity participation and then basically sells or gives the uh, patents uh, to the um, spin-out um, either at cost or with some simple milestone payments. And that means that they become stakeholders in parallel with the founders and the investors and everybody that is driving the process forward rather than being arguing against them. And I think, quite frankly, that that is a model for public universities to think about. They are not in the business of making money. They are in the business of stimulating socioeconomic uh, uh, development. I've always felt that you know, private universities might take another uh, approach because they are private and they, they own their stuff, but I'm happy to hear that some pub, uh, uh, private universities may uh, take a different approach to that. So those are some of my initial thoughts. Thank you. Professor Nelson, I, I noticed in your talk that you gave lectures on how you create a culture. Uh, and I thought uh, maybe you could explain to us how you create a culture of innovation. <laughs> Well, I'll spend about 15 seconds on each of the different courses, or each of the different lectures I give, uh, and then I'll keep to the time limit. <clears throat> um, I'm very glad that both of you talked about intellectual property, because I do think that patent and copyright are a major barrier, particularly in the United States. But I won't spend an hour on that topic, although I'd, I'd be happy to do so. I've already given you a couple of key words in my lecture. I talked about prototype, prototype, prototype. And that really is what you can do now in my field. You can try five things at once and then try it again. I also mentioned analytics and the power of big data. And I talked a lot about transparency because I think government policies that promote transparency have benefits throughout the innovation ecosystem. Getting more government data available to more people, um, learning more from each other because you're more transparent. But let me give you a few more words. First, double deep. And by this I mean we need to train students and employees who aren't super, super, super specialized. They know one thing really well and they know something else. So they might be really good in biology and they know how to use networking technology. They might be really good in material science and they might also be really good in social networking. I mean, they, they combine digital skills with other skills. Our program does this, but there's a huge need for these kind of people who can bridge the gap between the different worlds of the techies and the marketing people and the lawyers and the politicians. We don't have nearly enough of those types of people. And, and academia is not set up to produce them. Almost every university in the world is still organized by discipline, and yet we need people who cross disciplines. I think if we can do that, then we can have people who can function in different parts of the economy. Uh, the U.S. is getting better and better about taking people out of business and putting them in government. They spend some time in academia. So there is this flow of ideas. Too many cultures, France is a great example. You decide on what college you go to, that determines what your career will be. I know that's not quite the case in Denmark. I like the Icelandic model. When you only have 340,000 people, everybody has to do three jobs. So when I was there, I met, I met the head of the largest brewing company who was also the defense minister, who was also head of the Chamber of Commerce. That guarantees cross-fertilization. <laughs> another, another word I want to mention, really important, failure. Enable and celebrate failure. Very few cultures do that. Silicon Valley does. You can't become a CEO unless you've got at least one good failure behind you. And that is also related to my last point, which is, is quality. And I think that's where we have to keep focused. There's a wonderful new movie called Jury Dreams of Sushi. J-U-R-I. Jury is the name of the world's best sushi chef. He's 80 years old. He has a restaurant in Tokyo with eight seats. His entire career has been focused on making better sushi tomorrow than he did today. And the whole movie is about how that changes the way you do business. So 
quality in research, quality in education, quality in government. And I think the best way to get that is through the transparency. But, but it's easier to be transparent if you allow people to fail. People will tell you what they're doing if you don't punish them when they screw up. And they'll become higher quality people the next day because of that. So those are my simple thoughts, and I'm happy to talk at length now or whenever, online, Skype, any way you wish. Well, I think actually we all agree and we, we always say to each other that this increased circulation would actually be tremendously useful. And maybe I wouldn't use Iceland as the example. Uh, they were a little you know, too innovative uh, <laughs> in the banking sector. <laughs> but, but again... How, but they weren't how, transparent. Yeah. <laughs> But, but how can you actually do that? It's easy to say you should do it, but as you all know, there are huge barriers to do that. Some places people are more successful at this than at other places, but I don't think at least here we have a, an, a, a, as high circulation as you would find optimal. What, what, what would stimulate circulation? I can tell you what we do at Carnegie Mellon. You can start at the universities, and what we did is we, we actually uh, embedded into our tenure and promotion system uh, interdisciplinarity. And so we didn't say if you're not interdisciplinary that you won't get tenure. But we say if you're interdisciplinary, then that's a value add. You're somebody we want at Carnegie Mellon. You're the kind of person. And, we, and, then, and we just, from the, from the president, the provost, the deans, the department heads, we send that message throughout the whole faculty. So if you're incredibly disciplinary at Carnegie Mellon, you, 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 you'll be okay. You better be very good. But if you're interdisciplinary, you're one of us. And we started at the top, and we just, we just pushed this down through the ranks of the faculty. And it took a long time to you know, get this into the system. But uh, it's, it's perfectly fine because we didn't say if you didn't do it, you wouldn't get tenure. We just said that if you do it, it's, a, it's like diversity. Diversity equals excellence. If you're diverse, then, you, uh, then you're excellent. If you're interdisciplinary, then you equal excellent. And professors have one thing in common. They want to be excellent. And they will do whatever it takes to be excellent, whatever that is. If they're the best person in the world of calculating the energy of hydrogen to 95,000 decimal places, then that's what they do, and they're the best in the world at it. But they want to be excellent. And so it's very easy to, you know, you can't, you can't fire professors. It's difficult to do anyway. Uh, you, can, you can only torture them. <laughs> you, can, you can take their space away or you can, you know, give them a lot of committee work and, you know, cause them trouble. And as an administrator, you get very good at this over, over time. But, uh, but what you can do is you can motivate them by your attention uh, and listening to them and, and, and treating them with... Uh, and so when, when you see the vice rector, you know, uh, Thomas goes to his faculty that's highly disciplinary, interdisciplinary and starting up companies, and that's the person they're rolling out to speak to the board and to, you know, the, the, the donors and the ministers and things like that. People notice that, and they adapt because they want to be, ver they want to be considered excellent. So um, let me make an observation then. Uh, so in, in academia, we have these three uh, criteria for getting promotion, research, teaching, and service. For many years, uh, people have talked about innovation and socioeconomic development as the fourth criteria uh, and counting patents and stuff like that as a, as a part of the Bragg sheet. That has not happened anywhere. And it uh, sounds like in your case, you have, like you said, forced from the top down cross-disciplinary values. Uh, would you consider doing that also for this fourth category I mentioned? Yeah, I don't know. That's pretty, it uh, gets to be pretty controversial if you write it down. <laughs> so uh, we, it's well known, but it's not, it's, not, it's not written down. You know, we're not very successful, and I think it is very difficult in academics to have joint appointments. You know, we try to say that, uh, oh, we're real smart. We have a chemistry faculty. He's half chemistry and he's half chemical engineering or, or whatever. But actually, it just, it just means the person has to sort of uh, have two audiences, and it's very complicated. We do some of that, but I don't think that's a very good way to solve the problem. I think another issue we have to look at is the concerns about 
conflict of interest. And that's one of the problems we've had in the US when we've tried to move people from one institution to another, particularly when you move people from business into government. There's always this fear, oh my goodness, this person's gonna have conflict of interest and he's gonna do things with government policy to reward his former employer. And I, I think we need creative conflict of interest. We need to allow people to move from one place to another and to bring their interests with them. Just be clear what they are, be transparent. I've seen too many cases where incredibly good people who needed to be in the policy process were told they couldn't be part of it because they knew too much about the field. They were too conflicted. They were too interlinked with the, with the community that they needed to work with. So I think we have to deal with that problem. I also, I do think we need some really innovative changes in the, in the university system. And it probably will be require some changes in the, the actual structure. I think we start with the funding. If, if, if most of the money from the research agencies continues to be given out to different disciplines, then that's the way universities will organize themselves. When I did my PhD, I combined physics, geology, and, and paleomagnetism. And we went and got funding, we tried to get funding from each of the three different places in the research agency. And each time we were told, well, no, no, you have to go get money for those guys. All three of the different groups told us the other group should be funding us. And I've also seen where disciplinary, cross-disciplinary researchers who have joint appointments are the first ones fired because they're not really, really part of the program. They're, they're up there in the interdisciplinary space. Two comments on that. One is uh, you uh, can also influence the funding agencies within your country to say that the proposal should be interdisciplinary. And believe me, people chasing money, they'll adapt very quickly. Uh, and they've done a lot of that in the United States. They've been very far behind, but they're now starting to move in that direction. The other thing I'd like to say, I always say if you don't have a conflict, if you don't have a conflict of interest, you may not be doing anything that's interesting. I mean, that's a provocative <laughs> statement. But, but let me clarify, you, you, con, there's nothing wrong with having a conflict of interest. It's acting upon the conflict of interest. And, if, and, and I think this is something we've, we've worked very hard at the university to say, I mean, we're, cr we're crazy at Carnegie Mellon, okay? So I am the most conflicted person. I'm in charge of corporate contracts. I'm in charge of spin-out companies. Uh, I have two spin-out companies. Uh, I'm, a, I'm the chief scientific officer of one. I'm a founder, I'm on the board. Some universities won't allow that at all. And uh, they say, yo, you can be, a, you can start a company, but you can't be involved in it. And I think <laughs> if you're not involved in it, then you, you're not good. But, it, but if you're using that company to bring in grants, and then you pay yourself, you take your, your grant that you get in your lab, and then you subcontract your company, and then you pay yourself $100,000 a year in the company, okay, that's acting upon a conflict. But being involved in both things is really, is really should be promoted. People get all caught up in this conflict of interest. There's nothing wrong with it. You just can't act upon it. And you have to watch people because they're, in, you know, they're in, er, inherently going to do something wrong. But it's not that bad. Good. Uh, yeah. Th thank you. I think there are many things that we could continue in this discussion. Because, but uh, I actually promised last that I would not lose more time in the program. And I have always done uh, what Lars told me to do. Uh, so even though you are waving your hands, uh, you won't get your 30 seconds. Uh, <laughs> sorry, because a really good joke, then you will get 30 seconds. I just wanted to congratulate uh, ATV on its 500th anniversary. Because in internet years, you are 500 years old. And that's the speed we'll be moving at going forward. Good. Thank you.